My mama read a story from the Bible long ago. tonight, Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to read from verse 18 to the remainder of the chapter, verse 25. Genesis 2, starting in verse 18. And the Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help meet for him. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. He took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Let's pray. Well, we praise you tonight for this chance to be together. We're thankful for your word as it's opened in front of us. We pray, Lord, that you would allow it to, to work in us, to help us with our understanding, Lord, uh, of just uh, everything that you've laid out through creation and, and what you've done and where you've put man and how you've put man. And Lord, may we be able to give you glory 
Lord, for the love you have for us, and Lord, for you being the sovereign God. We love you, we thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so we're still on day six. Again, remember, uh, chapter one was the, the historical account of each day and, and of what happened each day. As we got to chapter two, unlike some people that want to argue that, that it's a different, whole different thing, it's really just now a detailed account of what happened on day six, which was the crowning achievement of God's creation when he created uh, for the first time something in his own image, which was man. And so he's created man in his own image. He's given him dominion over everything. Uh, last time we talked about uh, he planted a garden east uh, of his land, east of Israel, uh, in a place called Eden. Uh, we know that uh, according to this, there's been no weeds yet. There's been uh, no no crops grown yet because there's no tilling of the ground because there's not been the fall. There, there's no rain because there hasn't been the flood and everything is perfect. We left off with, uh, uh, again, there being two trees in the midst, one being the tree of life, of eternal life, two being the tree of the fruit uh, of the knowledge of good and evil, which uh, Adam has been commanded not to eat thereof. So we get to, to uh, today's text, and, and we've got a problem. If you look back in chapter 1, uh, when we get the creation account of him creating man, look at 27 and 28 again, and let's remind ourselves what it says. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now back to our text. We're in the middle of, of day six, and we've got the issue. If God has commanded for man to, to be fruitful and multiply, well, we can't do that right now because there's just Adam. And so that's where we find ourselves uh, uh, here in Genesis chapter 2. He needs a relationship. When man was created in the image of God, he was given specific characteristics and a specific nature. And we're the one creation that has the potential for a relationship, for the intellectual relationship amongst ourselves. And so here is Adam and he finds himself uh, alone. He needs a helper. He needs a partner. In common sense, he has to have somebody if he's going to be fruitful and multiply and reproduce. We know we're still on day six, and then I say that because of this. Because back as the, as the text starts in verse 18, and the Lord God said, what? It's not good. Well, at the end of day six, what did he say? He saw all, and it was very good. So we get to the end of the day and everything's very good. Here in the middle of day six, it's not good. There's a problem. Adam doesn't have a helper. He does not have, as King James Version here tells us in verse 18, a help me. He said it's not good that man should be alone. Because as he's created everything else, he's created male and female. He's created pairs. He's created two. But with Adam, he has only created one. It's not good for Adam to be alone. We saw a real life example of that about 15 minutes ago. Because when Sadie got taken away, Silas was not good alone and he left too. <laughs> she gone, I'm gone too. It's not good to be alone. Well, that's what God said. Hey, it's not good. So I'm going to make a help me for Adam. I'm going to make, NIV and ESV use it this way. They say, a helper suitable for him. Because you can, you can have an animal that helps do things, but to have that relationship, to have that 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 ability to, to talk with and communicate and do things that's nature of man, there had to be another human. There had to be something. So it's a helper that's suitable for him. Uh, uh, the Hebrew original language just means a helper like him. To compliment him. I don't mean to say, boy, you look handsome today. Not that compliment. But to compliment. To go together with. Like peanut butter compliments jelly. 
like for all fat people, gravy compliments biscuits and that kind of thing. It's a compliment. And so that's what God has designed in coming up with creating Eve, a helper that's suitable for him that will compliment him. Now, you can really get way off in the weeds of this, and that's not my desire. Now, but I do want to look at a couple of things. Uh, Brad, could you go to 1 Corinthians 11, 7? 1 Corinthians 11, 7. And, and Paul gives a little description here that, that makes some people uncomfortable. We're going to read 7, 8, and 9, Brad. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. He had just gotten over some things about what a woman should do as far as how she's adorned in public. But he says, a man indeed ought not to cover his head. Although, like me and Robbie had ours covered tonight, that's not what means. <laughs> For as much as he is the image of the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. Lady God, I don't know why I like where this is going. Let's read verse 8. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Verse 9. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Because, because here's what we get in the creation account. God formed a man out of the dust of the earth. But as we get to in our text here, he didn't create woman out of the dust of the earth. He created woman out of man. And so that's what Paul is using as his relationship here is that woman was not created like man was created. She was created as a helpmate. She was created as a partner. She was created to compliment him. But she was created out of him. He was created in the image of God out of the dust of the ground. She was created from Man and so man is given dominion, and boy, that that crosses a lot of folks. But if your Bible's open, look at Genesis three, verse sixteen. Make with me, or just one turn the page. Genesis three sixteen. After sin, after the fall, is God is laying out the consequences of what they did in eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Look at sixteen. Unto the woman he said. I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. God made a design. God made a plan. Don't get mad at me. You can get mad at God if you don't like that. That's the way it's laid out. And so that's with that and with how woman is created, it's where Paul gets how he writes 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Well, we'll get more into to Eve here in a second. Let's go back to the text in verse 19. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field. So every beast of the field, every fowl of the earth is created out of the ground, out of the dust, out of the dirt, just like he did man when he created Adam. Because again, you start getting into the science stuff, you get into chemistry makeup, they're made up of all the same elements that you find in the earth. And so he creates everything from the dust of the field. And he does that, and then it says he brings them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Again, we, we, we covered this probably too extensively when we first got into Genesis. But it rules out any former idea of evolution. God created the animals. He brings them to Adam. Adam names them. There's no, it's all happening on the same day at the same time. So there's no evolution here. So again, the design is pairs, male and female. And remember, Adam's, Adam's only a few hours old right here. He ain't like he's been around a while. He's just a few hours old, but th there's no doubt he's starting to notice something that, that every animal, there's a pair. There's a male and a female. There's two. It doesn't take him long to look around and say, well, there ain't, there ain't two of us. There's just one of me. And so there's nobody for Adam to, to establish a relationship with. Verse 20 says, And Adam gave names to all cattle and the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But here we go again. The sad story. But for Adam, there was not found a help me for him. There was not found a suitable helper. 
Because again, to have that relationship, we don't believe in evolution. He didn't look over and go, you know what, that monkey looks a little bit like me. Maybe me and the monkey can just get together. It's not how it happened. It's not it. There was not found. As every animal went by, he named every one of them. He never found and said, you know what? That's like me. Maybe I can have a relationship with, no, there was nothing. He couldn't find one. And so now there is that problem. So God's going to take care of that problem. Verse 21, we get God being the first anesthesiologist and God being the first surgeon. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. He put him out. Thank goodness, because it would have been painful if he had Puts him in a deep sleep. It says, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. That word that gets translated rib here, it appears in the Bible 35 times. Genesis is the only time that it gets translated rib. Every other time it gets translated side. But we'll see in a minute where you can take the, the fact that it's translated side and, and, and come up with the idea that it's rib. Because what God does here, according to, to the Holy Spirit moving Moses to write this, is that he puts Adam to sleep and he opens up his side and he takes something out. And what he takes out, he will then take to form and make E. You'll notice what it says in verse 23. After it's all said and done, Adam says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And so what we get here is the idea of what God took out. When God opens up Adam's side, he takes out some bone and some flesh. Well, now we would see why you would get the translation of a rib. Because if you open up your side, the only bone you're going to find is a rib. So that's where we get that, that idea of even though that's the only place it's ever translated, well, that's the only bone in your side. Especially if somebody like me, that's the only bone you're going to find on the side. The rest is a bunch of flesh and meat. But he took out a bone. Now, again, the idea here is that God is going to take that and create woman. Don't start counting. Men do not have one less rib than a woman has. We all got the same amount of ribs. That's not the idea. The idea, again, here is that God is going to create woman out of man. So he takes him out. He closes him up. He does all of that. And if you want to get into the to the uh, comical part of it, you know, you say, I, you know, woman's been a pain in our side ever since. Or if you want to get even more comical, you'd say, well, it wasn't been the side he took her out of it. That's what it was. But uh, he does that. And then Adam wakes up. Now, remember, as as the chapter, as the end of the chapter is gone, Adam has taken all of God's creation and named each one. It says that God brings them. And so now God is going to, to bring him this creation. And it's interesting how, how it says it. Notice again in, in verse uh, 22. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So he's going to make her and then bring her to Adam just like he brought all the other things that he created for Adam to name, he's going to bring Eve for Adam to name. But it says he made her. He made her. It's the same Hebrew word for build. He built her. He took that bone, that rib, that bone, that flesh from Adam's side, and he built Eve. Same idea as of taking stone and wood and building a building. He took her and he, as some translations say, fashioned her. But he, he built Eve and he brings her to Adam. Adam is smitten. And he shouldn't have been. Because again, remember, he's been looking around. He's only a few hours old, but he's noticing. There's two horses, two lions, two cows. Ain't but one of me. So I'm ain't right with the equation. I'm missing something. And so he's wondering. And then God puts him to sleep, wakes him up, and then brings him Eve. Well, I don't know how pretty Eve was. 
Well, she's a lot prettier than a horse or a cow or a lion, you know. <laughs> and he immediately erupts. Verse uh, 23 says, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. It, it's, it's an actual, uh, in the original Hebrew, it's a poem. It's poetry. He's smitten. Some of you guys were smitten by that and sitting beside you at one time or another. <laughs> you might have wrote her some poetry. Roses are red, violets are blue. I love you, I love you. I don't know what you <laughs> But Adam's smitten. He sees something beautiful. Now again, we haven't gotten to the fall. There's no sin yet. There's, no, there's nothing. But he sees beauty. Just as he's seen the Garden of Eden is beautiful. Just as he's seen all of God's creation is beautiful, now God brings him Eve, and he sees beauty. And he got to name every animal, so now he's going to name Eve. He's going to call her what she is. And it says here that at the end of verse 23, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Go back to the Hebrew. In Hebrew, man or male is ish. Boy, don't that fit us. Ish. We're ish. But female, woman, is isha. Know that sound much better? Ish. Isha. Because isha came out of ish. And so Adam names her, calls her Isha. But there's another little noteworthy thing here. Ish is, is the Hebrew word that's translated in, in male or man. Isha is the female or woman translation. But the root word that's used that Isha comes from actually means this. Soft. So the first thing Adam thinks and sees when he sees Eve for the first time, soft. He's smitten, boy. She is something else. And finally, he has what, just for a few hours now, he's longed for a companion, a helper suitable for him, a person that he can have a relationship and share things with with. And now for a few hours it seemed like he was incomplete. Now he can see himself and feel himself as complete. The perfect compliment. Again, not compliment, hey, you're, you're pretty, but compliment fit together like peanut butter and jelly. Then we get God to come on the scene and give us a little commentary. Verse 24 says this, Therefore, Shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. God's commentary on the very first marriage on the idea of a marriage relationship. The foundation for marriage, for family, for procreation is all laid out here in verse 24. Man and woman. I'll say that again. I know that don't cause any problem with us in here, but it causes lots of problems elsewhere. Man and woman. No second option. Sorry, but that was not part of God's design. Again, the, the old joke was always he created Adam and Eve. He didn't create Adam and Steve. He had a purpose in how he created and how he laid out marriage and how he laid out the family. He establishes God's plan for how man can be fruitful and rule over creation. And that is through the institution of marriage. Everything is laid out perfectly. We don't have father and mother yet. They, have, they don't have a child. But God already has established, determined the order. And he says there that, uh, uh, again, in verse 24, that uh, father and mother shall, that man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. And they will become one flesh. 
God's design for marriage, God's design for procreation, and God's design for making Adam complete, where after that few hours he thought that he was not complete. Verse 25 finishes up and says this, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Why were they not ashamed? Because there's no evil yet. There's been no sin yet. They haven't partaken of the forbidden fruit yet. They haven't gone against God's command to not eat of that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there, there's no sexual desire here. There's no wickedness here. There's nothing perverted here. There's no wicked thoughts in their imaginations. There's no shame. Because shame is produced by the consciousness of the evil that may exist in a thing. And there was no evil yet. So there was nothing that could exist. So everything is laid out perfect. You'll notice that God's plan for marriage and God's plan for man and woman is all laid out perfectly. After the fall, as you continue into Genesis, when sin enters, that's when all that stuff begins to fall apart. It's after the fall and after the sin that we'll begin to see all the, the perversions and, and, and the fornication come up. You'll go through Genesis and you think, man, what well, these folks were doing, it's like a big soap opera. That's what you get. Because once sin enters in and man's imagination and evilness gets in it, then you add all the other stuff. Then you add the homosexuality and then you add the, the uh, incest and you add the break. You add all the bad stuff that's all in, in Genesis all happens after the fall. Before the fall, God's plan for man and woman was perfect. Family was perfect. And then the devil began assaulting it as soon as sin entered the picture. And if that's the one thing that can tear every nation apart right now, the devil's using it, is tear apart the family. Tear apart man and woman's relationship biblically according to how God laid it out. Let's do all this other stuff. Let's be inclusive. Let's be open-minded. All that is is the devil's version of I'm going to tear down what God created and what God made perfect. Because let me tell you something. When he brought Eve to Adam, and Adam said, boy, now it's flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones. He was under the spell. And most of us are still under the spell today. And they're right, but we're still under the spell. <laughs> it was perfect. God had it laid out just like it was supposed to be. And if he just hadn't ate of that fruit, I know, that's what we'll get to next week, Lord willing. Let's stand while Denise comes with a verse of invitation. <laughs>